So friends, I have to apologize. This is going to be a revised edition. Uh, the other day when I edited this out and I'm not making excuses, I'm just going to tell you what happened. I had been moving my business. I started on the 22nd of March and, uh, this video came out last Thursday. So last Wednesday I was editing it, which I think would have been the 13th day in a row that I had been moving. Uh, my business, I finally finished on the Friday following, which was just a few days ago. And I was exhausted. And to be honest with you, I figured that I would be done with the move before it was time to make this video. Uh, but unfortunately, I was not. I expected to be done by Monday, which I had a video for Monday. Uh, so I sat down and created this video. And honestly, the video was only about uh, the few things that were bought at OK Hauk. It wasn't about Elvis's guitars and all that kind of stuff. But the Elvis version of this, the uh, guitars and the dates, and I guess not really the dates, uh, but and I'm still tired, but I, I think I'm cognizant enough to, to fix this. Uh, the, the number of guitars and all that kind of stuff, I didn't get right. So I'm going to go back and try to fix that here, but I can't go through all of the guitars. I'll just go through the first few and try to straighten it out and give you a, uh, a, a little bit of an overview that is corrected. So everybody <laughs> will quit freaking out. And look, I'm a guitar guy. I own about 20 guitars, uh, but I'm not an expert on Martin guitars by any stretch. Uh, but I'm going to see what I can do. Stay tuned. So friends, that is South Main Street. This is South 2nd Street. That is the Peabody Hotel right there. B.B. King Boulevard is the next street down. This is 121 Union. That is where the O.K. Hout Piano Company was that Scotty Moore bought his ES-225 from and then went back and traded it for, uh, I believe it was an L5. So a lot of instruments came from this place. I believe that uh, the bass amp that Elvis bought Bill Black came from here and a lot of other instruments. It is actually a Thai and sushi restaurant now. But if you happen to be here in Memphis and you want to see this location, that's Huey's on the corner. The baseball uh, field is the next block down on BB King right on the corner. Madison Cadillac is further down on the right hand side so it's easy to get to. You come to the Peabody and walk right down and it is right there. So Scotty Moore walked in there and bought iconic guitars that are on iconic recordings right there friends it happened right there 121 union so let's dig into this a little bit this right here is where out of elvis's expense account for payroll where they paid for a Fender Basement amplifier for Bill Black. You see it says purchased 52456 for Bill Black. Was paid for in November of 56. So I guess they allowed him to just uh, haul it around for a period of time. This thing started showing up uh, around May the 24th, it says. And uh, you start seeing it in photographs. Here's an example right here. And of course, that double bass is not very loud on its own, although it's, it has a sound hole in it. It's not very loud, especially if you're playing with the crowd. So they finally had to invest in an actual uh, amp so you could hear his double bass guitar, which is this uh, that you see, this, what we call a stand-up bass, some would say. And another aspect is they had uh, just right around this time added DJ Fontana as the drummer. So he needed to be loud along with the drums. That's another piece of that little puzzle. And although uh, he didn't buy this till May the 24th, there's photos of a basement as early as April the 20th of that year. But what I speculate is they loaned him one or someone loaned him one or he tried it out and decided he liked it and decided to go ahead and buy one. So bought one local in Memphis. But clearly he had it and that right there shows that he paid for it. When I say he, I mean Elvis paid for it for Bill Black. And I may be wrong, but I believe that basement amp right there is uh, on display at Graceland across the street. So Scotty Moore bought this guitar, an ES-295. ES means electric Spanish 
295. Had open F holes, hollow body. Here's him playing it right here with Elvis. And Gibson put out a uh, Scotty Moore signature ES-295 Gibson guitar. This is an example in uh, to commemorate uh, Scotty, and they did this. Scotty was still alive when this happened. Very cool guitar. They sold for about $8,000, and they only made 81 that Scotty autographed. Then he went back into OK Hawks, and I may not be pronouncing that right, but that's how I'm going to pronounce it. And he bought, he traded, well, I shouldn't say he bought, he traded this guitar here in on an L5 Gibson. So right here, if you look, it says Winfield S. Moore. He lived at 983 Bells, which is the place that I took you and showed you that Elvis came and auditioned for him. So he was still living at Bells. This was July the 7th, uh, uh, 1955 which was almost exactly a year after Elvis auditioned at his house. And they, they recorded uh, That's All Right Mama on July the 5th, 1954. So you see in that period of time, they were able to move from a ES-295, which was a good guitar, to a much higher quality L5. Uh, and the CES means Cutaway Electric Spanish. And you see it was $565, which was a lot of money. He also got the case, and you see it even gives a serial number, A18195. Now, down further, you see it says trade-in Gibson ES295 and case, and he basically gave him $56.56 is what it looks like for it, which is crazy because that guitar is worth a lot of money today, and it is in private collector's hands and I showed you a picture a moment ago of the actual guitar so it didn't get just uh, thrown away or lost so this is Scotty's L5 and this is a photo of Scotty with Elvis playing the L5 and I know for a fact that Scotty thought a lot of that guitar and thought a lot of this photograph because when I started uh, selling photographs for him, this is the very first photograph that I sold, and we sold tons of them. It was his main one he autographed. And this guitar was used on Mystery Train as well, no doubt. So I found this. This is an example of where Scotty started doing a, uh autograph. It's for my friend, and you see he messed up on friend, so he just said, ah, oh, this is messed up. Give me another one and handed it to me, and I kept it. And this is an example of the certificate of authenticity that I made up. Gail Pollock, his personal secretary girlfriend, signed under witness. I signed the other witness. And you see Scotty signed at the top. And if you bought a keepsake from me, uh, you got this certificate of authenticity with it. And I would guess that would have been between 2000 and sometime in 2002 off the top of my head. So right here's where this video really went off the rails. After I went back and watched, I was like, my Lord, how in the world did I do this? So the let's start over again. This guitar that you see in this picture is actually what they call a triple O 18 Martin. Elvis bought this particular guitar sometime before the first Louisiana Hayride show in October of 1954. It was used, and he bought it from Sid Lapworth, and we're going to talk about Sid a little bit later in this video. Um, but he paid $79.50 for it, paid $5 down, and $10 a month for it. And uh, he traded in his first guitar, which uh, Sid uh, said he really didn't know, remember what it was or even recall it. But that guitar was the one that was used in some of the first Sun recordings. So it's out there floating around somewhere, and we really don't know what it is. Uh, and he traded it for this guitar. In the previous video, I was talking about his original guitar from Tupelo Hardware. Nix that. That is not accurate. It is the double O or triple O 18 that we were talking about, or I should have been talking about. And notice that, um, as I mentioned in the other one, he put his name on it. They did these things called autograms. So when Sid would sell a guitar, he'd give a set of strings, some picks, or that he would give you your name and letters. And Elvis chose his name and letters, as you can see right here on this guitar. So sometime around January of 1955, he traded the Martin 0018 in for a 1942 Martin D18 at OK Hauk again, did business with Sid Lapworth. Sid gave him the uh, 
uh, payments he had made on the 7950 purchase for the triple O 18 in trade towards the D 18. So you see, he was starting to make a little more money. So he was spending money on better instruments. And this uh, D 18 was used to perform and record uh, until sometime after June the 15th of 55, where he purchased a Martin D 28. And you see that he put his name on there, Elvis, but he put it on straight instead of at an angle. So when he traded for the D28, it's believed to be a 54-55, and they weren't sure whether it was a uh, used instrument or not, but it appeared to be based off of what he paid for it. Not long after he purchased it, he uh, began using a custom-made tool leather cover, which a lot of you have seen, with Elvis Presley emblazoned across the front of it. According to Jimmy Rogers Snow, Elvis had seen one that Hank Snow had and liked it. Hank had, had his made by a prisoner years, years earlier, Elvis's leather cover was made by Marcus Van Story in a basement of O.K. Houck's where he occasionally worked in the piano repair shop for this particular guitar. At some point during the week of August the 13th, between August 13th and 20th, 55, he had the opening of the leather made larger. Uh, and it was, we don't know if Marcus did it or not, but we think it was because of his strumming style. He strummed so hard, maybe the leather got in the way. And here's an example of a broken string. So he was really strumming the guitar hard as he could go uh, to break a string like that. But something else I want to point out is how he uh, uh, used his strap on the guitar. If you'll notice in this picture, he's got the strap. A lot of, uh, I'm a guitar player, and a lot of us use a strap, and you'll put it on one of the tuning pegs. This, he wrapped the strap around the head of the guitar and kind of tied it in a knot. Or it pulled through a loop and had a uh, kind of a latch to it and then tied it in a knot. You see, kind of like a belt buckle. Very interesting way to put your strap around your guitar. And uh, the D28, this particular guitar, dropped completely out of sight when uh, Elvis moved to a J200. And according to Jimmy Velvet, the tooled leather cover that you see was found in the attic of Alan Fortis, Elvis's friend and bodyguard. Uh, and it was sold sometime after Alan's death to someone in Japan, and it is in Japan now. So let's talk about how Elvis started playing a Gibson J200. So in October of 1956, Scotty had a, reg a recent endorsement with Gibson, and Elvis uh, began using his new J200N guitar. Uh, same thing through OK How. They hoped to actually present Elvis with the guitar, but he never, uh, he was delayed and didn't get to the store, and uh, Scotty actually picked it up and it was invoiced to, um, uh, Scotty picked up the guitar and Gibson invoiced it to him because the Colonel wouldn't allow Elvis to have endorsements. So what's interesting is he used the J 200 in October of 56. Then in November of 56, he went back to the, uh, the D 28. And then for his final shows at the Louisiana Hayride, he went back to the J200. And I'm sure he was so used to the D28 that it, he was trying to adjust and then finally decided to stick with the J200. And another aspect is he got crazy rich during this time uh, in 1956. So he was able to buy any guitar he wanted. Uh, his friend Charles Underwood made him this tooled leather cover, which you see here in his last, uh, this is actually rehearsal for his last appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show, and he used it in all 20 of his live appearances in 1957. Of course, he went in the Army in 1958, and it was used by Elvis in concerts and record all the way up to 1971. And I got to point out that I know you're looking at this guitar going, this looks different than the other guitar. In 1960, Elvis asked Scotty to send this thing to have it repaired, tuned up, if you will, at Gibson. So Scotty sent it back to Gibson and had the inlay done, um, had the, uh, with Elvis Presley, had the custom pick guard done, had a lot of modifications on it. And here's a, uh, a publicity photo for Wild in the Country with him with the new version of the guitar. So that is the original version. You also see Elvis play a J200 in some movies. This is an example of GI Blues. That is a Gibson J200, almost identical to the original one before it was modified, but not the same guitar. That's owned by Paramount Studios. So that guitar is out there in the world somewhere. And that somewhere is in the possession of Albert Lee, seen here with the guitar. 
That is believed to be that guitar that Elvis played in all those movies. Pretty incredible, I must say. So, friends, I mentioned in the uh, previous version of this video that he played the J200 pretty much the rest of his life. And to be honest with you, I thought that was accurate. Turns out not to be accurate at all. This is a J200 with the Kempo sticker on it. This next one that you're going to see is a Gibson Dove with the Kempo sticker on it. Very similar looking guitars, but two completely different things if you know a little bit about guitars. And he used this Dove uh, between November of 71 and September or sometime uh, September 73 and, so, and even in 75. The next one is the uh, 70s Gibson Dove Custom. He used it between 75 and 76. Then a 74 Guild F50. He used that in uh, 76 a couple of uh, times. Then he went to a, back to a Martin D35 between 1076 and 277. And if you've ever wondered when Elvis would throw his guitar to Charlie, did Charlie ever miss? The answer is yes. The D35 that we were just talking about, February 14th, 1977, Bayfront Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. Elvis's guitar strap broke, and in frustration, he tossed it more in the direction of Charlie Hodge than to him, and Charlie couldn't catch it, and it impacted and cracked the spruce top at the end of the guitar. It was reported that Elvis yelled out to the audience, which one of you waited the longest to see me here tonight? He eventually gave the guitar to a young woman who was waiting all night in a lawn chair to be one of the first admitted to the show and was in attendance with her mother. The guitar was sold at auction October 13, 2002 in New York for somewhere around $20,000. In 2007, it was uh, in the Rock and Soul Museum in Memphis on display. And I don't know if it is today, but it was in 2007. And then the very last concert tour, 277 to 677, he went back to a Martin D28. It would be an interesting study to figure out why he jumped around so many guitars. And of course, he had a lot of guitars. This is an example of photos, of course, at Graceland. I have a lot of guitars as well, about 20. Never can have too many, friends. So let's talk about Sid Lapworth. Sid sold uh, all these instruments to Scotty, Elvis, Bill, um, and Sid worked there, but he also played bass. And Bill came in uh, shortly after their first appearance on a Louisiana Hayride, which he knew he was going to have steady money coming. And he uh, asked if Sid had a bass that he could buy. So Sid said, yep, I have one at home that I will sell you, which is a three-quarter scale Maestro M1K bass. And he went to Sid's house to look at it. Sid's wife would not let him in the house, and they finally got that straightened out, and he went in and bought it and paid $120 cash for it. And he's pictured in using it in all the concerts and the movies. This is him in Loving You. And uh, later, that bass was sold to Mike Leach. Mike, you know from playing uh, with, he worked for Chip's Moment on the American Sound Studios. He played on the American Sound, uh, some of those recordings, Suspicious Minds, Kentucky Rain, that kind of stuff in the ghetto. It stayed in Mike's attic until the 70s. Later, it was sold to Buddy Killen, who they think bought it to sell it to Paul McCartney. And it was a gift from Linda to Paul McCartney. And he considers it one of his most prized possessions and has used it uh, on recordings and that kind of stuff. And incidentally, an interesting thing is they say that Bill Black would change Elvis's guitar strings and put the old strings inside of that bass. Another thing Bill did was put his name on the bass like Elvis did on his guitar. And we don't know what all Elvis bought from OK Hawk, but we know he bought a piano. So look right here. This was September the 30th, 1955. And keep in mind now, in January of 56, he recorded Heartbreak Hotel. And within months, he was very, very rich and very, very famous. But he bought this for 1414 Get Well, which was just before Audubon. So remember, he uh, lived here at 1414 Get Well. What I speculate, if you look on the bottom right, it shows his address as 2414 Lamar, which was the address before 1414 Get Well. I think maybe they had rented Get Well and he bought the piano because they had more room. It says trade-in allowance 50 in total down, so I think he paid $50 down. I don't see what he traded in, but he paid $275 for this piano 
and at auction, this piano sold for $140,000. This was his probably the first piano Elvis ever owned, and he had it at the Getwell house, and I assumed that it would have gone to the Audubon house as well, and so on and so forth. So there you have it, friends. Elvis, Scotty, and Bill did business right there. They tightened up and went to OK Hauk right there. And one little side note, one of you clever uh, subscribers, D. Cleveland, uh, one of my subscribers, pointed out that the day he bought the piano was the day that James Dean died. So Elvis found out that day James Dean passed away. And so, friends, thank you so much for watching this. I know this was a lot longer than the other one, but this has a lot more information. I was able to spend some more time and give you a little bit more stuff, and I apologize for the last one. While When I'm saying I was tired, I was just before falling over and trying to crank one out for you. So I did what I said. I do one every Monday, every Thursday on this channel. And unfortunately, I probably should have just said, friends, I can't make one happen and taking the time to do this like I did today. So thank you so much for watching and the support, and I appreciate you, friends. I tightened up and got this one straightened out. Thank you.